Thank you for tuning in to Teaching for the Culture. Um, thank you for tuning in to The Whole Child with my co-host, the fabulous Kimberlyn Jackson. She's amazing, y'all. And I was just telling her offline before I hit the um, play button that, like, y'all need to hire her. She's amazing. And, you know, I just appreciate her so much because she spends time, you know, with me. And she doesn't ask for anything in return. She's just giving her knowledge and her wisdom um, for the community. So shout out to you, Kimberlyn. I, I appreciate you from the bottom of my heart. I have to just say that and start with that because I just had to let the world know that you, you are a rock star, in my opinion. And your knowledge is so rich. And it's all about the children at the end of the day. So I do appreciate you. And um, welcome to the episode of Whole Child. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate you um, just for your spirit and you developing this platform for us to be, even be able to have these conversations. So I'm super grateful that you sought me out. Um, this is my passion in life. And it really is not about the money for me in that aspect. It's really about making sure that our kids are getting what they need, that our parents are being empowered to understand how they can make a difference so we can break these cycles. Um, I know that that's my personal mission on this earth is to be a cycle breaker in my own life. Um, so everybody that I come into contact with, I challenge them to do that. I firmly live by the mantra of leaving people better than I found them. So with everything that I do, um, I'm spirit led. So I am just so happy to be here and so grateful to even be able to share um, all of this knowledge that I have in my head with you and with the community, because I know that it's going to make a difference and it's going to impact the future. So I'm, I'm, I am bought in. I'm here. I'm ready. <laughs> I'm excited about our show today because I really think that it's going to help more so than think. I know that it is going to help some families. It's going to help some parents and it's going to help some kids. So. Um, I'm, I'm ready to get this started. If you all have missed our previous shows, definitely want to make sure that you go over to Teaching for the Culture um, to be able to check those out because we've been doing this. What what episode is this now? Maybe like four? Or I think this is five? episode five. Okay. So yeah, we've been doing this uh, quite a few times and we really just want to make sure that you get the info that you need to really help your kids to be able to succeed. You know, this podcast is called The Whole Child because we're really thinking about all of the, the layers that make us up and all of the layers that our kids uh, are going through and how we can really help them, not just as educators, but also as parents and community members and concerned adults in their lives. So. That's what we're here for. So if you've missed previous shows, make sure you go back and catch up because we have talked about boundaries and self-care plans and um, shared stories from students about how they feel. We've shared our own uh, personal traumas and things that we've gone through. So it's really important for us to be transparent in everything that we do. And um, we invite you to do the same. So um, as we're talking today, I'm gonna share a watch party over on my social media, just so I that, that um, we can really get people into this conversation because we truly believe that this is going to make a difference. So um, again, we want to get as many people in the room and here as we possibly can so that we can make the largest impact that we possibly can. So that's go. that. That. Is that. And this particular episode, um, you know, I, I think that this should be done as a family. We're talking about family work. Um, and so if you have kids nearby, pull them and say, hey, let's let's have this conversation. Let's listen to what, you know, these ladies have to say and let's talk about it after the fact, because at the end of the day, we need to have these conversations with our children because unfortunately, if you're not having those conversations with them, they're having it somewhere else. And I was just telling Kimberlyn of an app that's called Whisper. It's something that parents, you need to be intentional with some of the apps that your kids download. It's an anonymous app that kids are able to write messages and they're able to, you know, send things anonymously. And some of the things that are on that Whisper app is definitely heart wrenching. And I, you know, we don't know who these kids are that are mm -hmm. writing these messages, but it's a clear 
cry for help and a need for advice. They're asking for advice. Yeah. And so if they're asking for advice, that means that they don't feel comfortable enough sharing that with you at home. So we need to have conversations on how we can bridge that gap because unfortunately our kids are getting hurt and they're getting groomed by the same people um, that are giving them information and advice. Yeah, I know on our last show, we talked about giving our kids a voice, right, and acknowledging that kids do have a voice and they do have thoughts. And this example with the Whisper app lets me know that some of our kids don't feel safe sharing that voice at home and, and sharing what they're thinking about and what they're dealing with at home. So they turn to um, this app or they turn to their their friends or they turn to some random person who gives them some sense of belonging longing or uh, any type of sense of love if they have not seen genuine and authentic love. So that's that can be very scary, right? And we really want to highlight uh, this stuff so that we don't lose our children to people who are exhibiting predatory behavior and um, doing things intentionally to hurt them or to groom them or to place them in position where they are unsafe. So that's why we are here, right? This is driven by a real place. So um, we see you all coming on. We definitely want you to interact with us and talk to us. So if you'll go ahead and uh, say hey in the comments and let us know where you're watching from, just so that uh, we can have this community conversation, because this is a conversation that is going to impact all of us. And uh, we want to definitely make sure that you all are included in that. So I want to start this off by uh, just asking a question of how, um, what signs do you think there are that let you know that your child is, or your student or the young person in your life is in trouble or that they're feeling some type of way? What are some things that you feel may happen or that they may do not do what have you that lets them know that you that they lets you know that they are not okay and not feeling up to par put it in the comment y'all you guys that are watching we want to know what are some of those signs that you know that you know is happening with your kids if, if there's something going on because i think that this is something where a lot of people are missing um, we're missing the warning signs of our kids, and then we want to try to triage the problem, um, but we haven't gotten to the root, mm -hmm. and we don't know where that root came from, and we're not doing problem solving to figure out where that's coming from. Um, right. Right. So for those of you that's watching, put in the comments. We'd like to know. So over in my watch party, uh, Tamara from Atlanta, she said that there might be changed behavior um, that's noticed. Withdrawal may be something that you might see. What else do you all think? That withdrawal pieces is critical. It is. Um, and what we noticed, so being a middle school educator, um, you know, we, we know that middle school kids are already kind of all over the place, right? <laughs> They've got yeah. all the things happening um, with themselves. So sometimes we see these types of behaviors and we think that this is normal teen behavior, you know? Mm -hmm. So uh, one would think that it's normal for your teenager to decide that they don't want to be around the rest of the family. You know, um, so that's why it's so important. We talked about in, in podcasts prior to this of asking quality questions so that you can determine is this a one off or is the kid having a bad day or is there really serious issue that's going on? So LaWanda over in the watch party also said rage aggressive behavior, um, sexual behaviors may increase. For sure. Um, so what I want to do is talk about two uh, mental health issues that may come about um, that can really help us to notice when there is a change. And that's depression and anxiety. Now, first of all, let me say this, that I am not a, a therapist. I'm not a counselor. Um, I, I don't have the degrees in those things, right? What I am is a life coach. I am a mentor. I'm an advocate. And 
And I really, and I've been an educator for the past 14 years. So I'm not speaking from a clinical perspective. I want to get that you know, straight, but I am speaking from what I have seen um, and what I have noticed the patterns are, right? So when we're talking about depression and anxiety, especially in regards to e-learning and everything that's happened around this pandemic, and I'm going to continue to say that this pandemic has been a collective trauma for all of us. Some of us are kind of in denial that it was traumatic, but It was and is. Mm -hmm. Um, Some of us have lost family members. Some of us have lost our jobs. Like just all types of things have been happening. That's traumatic. So a trauma is anything that has caused some type of physical or emotional response in you that um, is, is causing difficulty in your spirit, right? So this pandemic is a collective trauma. The difference between us as adults and our children is that we have more control over the situation, whereas kids are kind of at the mercy of the adults that are in their lives. So they're doing their best to to do what they can do, but they have no power. They have no jobs. They have no money. Like they don't, they can't, you know, just go up, go out and and work and say, oh, I'm out of this. You know, I'm going to go do whatever. Like they're really at the mercy of everything else that's happening. So because of this lack of control, it often causes our kids to experience depression or anxiety. And sometimes we think that it may present itself a certain way, but not necessarily. So when we think about depression, I think the first thing that we think about is sadness, right? So we expect to see um, crying and um, just being really sad, unable to to be happy, um, you know, just that kind of down type of situation. But other things that we don't necessarily think about, for instance, are uh, changes in eating habits. So it could be eating more or eating less, or it could be like hiding food, right? So there's this level of shame that comes about. So now they're hoarding, let me say that. So hoarding things, right? So maybe you went off and bought all these quarantine snacks, right? And then all of a sudden they're all gone, but they are, they're hoarding the snacks because they are unsure if they're going to be there. So it creates this sense of shaky ground and a lack of certainty about what might happen. So I got to hold on to all of this, or they may feel like they need to ration certain things, you know, so if they have a candy bar, maybe they only eat half of the candy bar because they want to make sure they have more of the candy bar for later. Um, Or you might see certain things like uh, changes in sleep pattern. Now, I've talked about this, right? I just, my sleep is all over the place lately and I just am not going to bed at a at a, a normal time for me. My bedtime used to be a hard 11 o'clock. I could be out in the middle of the club and 11 o'clock hit and I was done like <laughs> in a corner somewhere like it's bedtime, right? But I've been finding myself being up to three, four in the morning, sometimes five, depending on what I'm watching on Netflix. Um, so you may find that your kids may be on Fortnite all, all night and you're thinking to yourself, oh, well, they're out of school, you know, it's totally fine. You know, they're just playing with their friends, but may need to actually examine that a little bit more to see what else is going on. Or um, you may see a plummet in their self-esteem. So you may start to hear uh, negative self-talk and hear them saying negative things about themselves. And um, LaWanda just mentioned like selective mutism, right? So now all of a sudden they're not really talking to said someone that used to talk a lot and is now talking way less, right? So um, you may see these types of things. And when they do say something, it might be super critical. They might be super critical of their siblings. So, you know, calling their siblings names and um, being aggressive, right? So being aggressive is actually a sign of depression. And one wouldn't necessarily make those connections when you're thinking about it. Um, You also might see physical pain. So you might see that they're starting to say that their stomach hurts. Um, They have a headache, right? And it might be really consistent. So being able to track that and track those triggers of when those things happen um, could let you know that this is a consistent thing and there are signs. This is a sign of some type of uh, depression or um, on the other 
hand of that, some type of anxiety. Now, one of the things that is causing anxiety for a lot of our students right now and people just in general is the fact that now the cities are opening back up. Right. And what's happening is marketing is shifting. So for the first part of this pandemic, it was all about we're to get what, what was it? We're standing together alone or something like that. Like it was mm -hmm. a lot of stuff talk focusing on that social distancing. Right. So we're we're in this together over there. Um, we're in the, you know, make sure that mm -hmm. you have your six feet, blah, 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 what have you. Well, now that the the cities are opening back up now, they got to try to get us to come back outside. Now they got to try to get us to come back to the restaurants and patronize these businesses. So a lot of gaslighting is going on. So gaslighting means that somebody is trying to create an alternate experience. So basically, if you pay attention to, to TV and marketing, what's going to happen is they're going to be like, oh, it wasn't that bad. Everything's OK. You can definitely come back over to your local restaurant and sit in here. And it's fine. Everything's fine. It's totally fine. Everything mm -hmm. is fine. Right. Mm -hmm. But it's not. It's not fine. So that dynamic of trying to navigate, do I get back to normal life? normal, whatever that looks like. Do I get back to normal life or do I continue being quarantined? Do I wear my mask? Because I notice that other people aren't wearing a mask, but is the virus still out here? Like what all of that causes angst and anxiety, not just for us, but also for our kids. Right. So being able to recognize that and really being able to help our kids to manage through that anxiety um, so that they are not having panic attacks and all of the things that can happen if this type of behavior continues. So when we're talking about this, I kind of put all of this into the the frame of social emotional learning. And we have a graphic um, up there and social emotional learning is not a new concept. Let me say that this is not something that's new. It is something that has been out, but it's something that we're realizing in schools and communities as um, educators that we really need to pay attention to to these different components. So I want to go through um, the five tenants and then we're going to kind of land just on two. So self-awareness is the first. So that's recognizing one's own emotions and values as well as one strengths and challenges. So really doing a reflective look at self and making yourself aware of what it is that you're feeling. Self-management is about managing those emotions and behaviors in order to achieve a goal. Social awareness has to do with showing understanding and empathy for other people and really understanding Understanding that other people are around and they have feelings and, you know, there are things that we do and say that impact others. The fourth is relationship skills. So it's about forming positive relationships, working in teams and dealing effectively with conflict. And then the last one is responsible decision making. So that's making ethical and constructive choices about personal and social behavior. So I want to kind of land, though, at the self-awareness and the self-management, because these are the base levels of intrapersonal skills that we need for ourselves as people, but especially for our our, for our children and for our students. So when we think about self-awareness, recognizing one's own emotions and what one is going through. So we've talked about on shows past, Bianca, about our triggers, right? Mm -hmm. Or the physical responses that we have that let us know that something isn't okay. And some of us are more in tune with our triggers than others. Um, some of us realize we have stuff going on while others of us are used to suppressing that and just chugging on along ahead like everything is just fine when it's actually not fine at all. It's not even close to fine. Um, so one of the first things that we want to do with our kids is to have those conversations about what they are feeling. Now, in order to have that conversation about what you are feeling, then you have to give them a platform to be able to express what they are feeling. Right. Mm -hmm. So this goes back to our last show when we talked about giving students, giving children a voice, you know. So when you mentioned the Whisper app and how students are anonymously talking about what they are feeling, that lets us know that they don't feel comfortable 
in talking about what they are feeling with the people that are in their lives, with the adults that are in their lives. So it's supremely important for us as adults to make sure that we make it safe for them to be able to share. So what does that look like? Well, some of us need to work on our poker face because we have no idea what they might say, right? So you have to set in your heart that I am willing to listen to whatever it is that they say, right? So Mm -hmm. if you ask them, you know, what what are your thoughts in regards to um, the city opening back up, for instance? And then you got to be quiet and let them answer. And it might take some time because they may not be used to you actually allowing them to answer. So they may look at you like, is like you, you really want me to, like you want a real answer, right? So then you encourage them. You're like, no, really, I, w- I want a real answer. Like what, what are your thoughts about, you know, the city opening back up? Mm-hmm. And then you wait (laughs) and embrace that awkward silence, right? And truly encourage them to answer that question and allow them to take it wherever it is that they want to take it. And then you can use that as a springboard to go to the next place in the conversation, right? So getting them and giving them an opportunity to be able to identify those feelings. What are you feeling? Um, what are, what what's happening within you that can give you some type of angst or what have you? So then after they talk about what they're feeling, well, now we want to talk about how to deal with that, right? So that's that self-management piece. So now that I recognize what I'm feeling, how do I deal with this self-management and self-regulation? So we have a video that we want to show you all. Um, And this video is about four minutes or so. And you can actually watch this with your kids, right? So we encourage you to to get your kids and and sit them in front of this. But we want to show you an example of what this looks like when one is trying to manage oneself with all of the emotions and feelings and thoughts that are going on within their minds and uh, stuff. So we're going to let y'all check this out for a second. So hopefully you all enjoyed that. I had some um, of LOLs over in the comments. So um, what that video really showed is all of the thoughts, all of the angst, all of the the, um, feelings and emotions that can go into um, a young person trying to manage what they are feeling. Right. Um, And you can hear them talk through some different strategies with Cookie Monster about how he can manage everything that's happening. So, again, when we go back to thinking about those signs of depression, for instance, or those signs of anxiety, and um, we mentioned that aggressiveness or rage or impulsivity is another sign that something is going on with with our kids. So giving them some tangible strategies that they're able to use so that they can learn to manage those emotions and learn it, learn to regulate what's happening inside them so that they are able to be um, able to be more balanced in their approach. So I posed a question over in um, my watch party and I asked, how do you help the kids in your life manage their emotions? So Lawanda said, I give them time to express themselves. Sometimes it's not easy for both parties, right? So Lawanda is kind of alluding to what we were just talking about a moment ago of really giving that child a voice and allowing them to be able to say what they are feeling, but then Mm -hmm. the discomfort that they may bring 
that may bring for us as an adult because we don't know what they're going to say. But it's so powerful to be able to give them the platform to be able to tell us what they are thinking and what they are feeling so that we know how to deal with that. Um, Meg over in the watch party said, providing a safe place, building the relationship and listening, not shaming or telling them that their feeling is bad. Mm -hmm. I think it was last show that, or maybe the show before where I shared, I never got to have a bad day as a child. Mm -hmm. In my house, I always had to be happy, right? So no matter if it was the worst day on the face of the earth, I had to be happy. I did not have the space to be sad or to be disappointed or to have um anything else going on besides happy feelings. My mama did not want to hear about it, right? So again, giving that space where it's safe. So I just mentioned a moment ago, if you ask them a question, they're not going to automatically just respond because they don't know if it's safe. They don't know if it's okay. Am I going to get in trouble if I say something? And are there going to be consequences after this if I talk about what I'm feeling and what I'm thinking? So it has to be a safe place for them to be able to contribute. So then with this self-management piece of it, I can't manage the emotions if I can't identify the emotions. I can't manage the behavior if I can't acknowledge that the behavior is existing. So Cookie Monster had a lot going on right there. You know, he's like, I love the cookies. <laughs> and you just going to sit them right here in front of me and tell me I got to wait? Say what now? Wait for what? And who? And all of the things that go along with it. So one of the strategies they talked to him about was the deep belly breathing. So you remember when we um, did an activity before talking about the deep breathing, Bianca? Yes, I do. <laughs> yes, I do. And I have um, a video from the Calm app um, if we want to do the exercise too. Yeah. So I think we should do the exercise just for the benefit of being able to um, remind everybody what this looks like. So before you play it, um, I just want to talk about the difference between deep breathing and breathing, right? So what we know is that when we breathe, we breathe like all day long, mm -hmm. right? If we weren't breathing, we'd be dead, okay? Um, so we are breathing, but most of the time we're breathing to sustain life. And in a situation where you are dealing with trauma or you are um, in the middle of depression, anxiety, mental health issues, confusion, um, uncertainty, right? In those moments, it's very likely that you're just breathing to sustain life. Breathing to sustain life is very shallow. Um, it really is the fact that oxygen is coming in your nose and carbon dioxide is coming out. Like that's it. There is no uh, cleansing that that goes with it. So when we talk about deep breathing, deep breathing is a way for us to have cleansing breaths. And cleansing breaths allow us to reset our spirit to reset our mind and truly connect to what we are feeling in that moment. So we are going to all do this together because I cannot say that I've done any deep breathing here today myself, um, but it's about time. So we're gonna take just about one minute and you're gonna follow the prompts that are on the screen. It's gonna tell you to breathe in, it's gonna tell you to hold, it's gonna tell you to breathe out, it's gonna tell you to hold. So we're just gonna go through this process for one minute. And before we play the clip, just a side note, Calm app has not paid for our endorsement. However, it is a phenomenal app um, to use. So I I'm just throwing that out there. But so here's the video.
So that was just about one minute, maybe 40 something seconds. Um, if you did that with us, I would like for you to drop in the comments what that felt like for you to take just one minute to do some deep breathing. So while they're doing that, um, Bianca, if you'll share, what did, what did that feel like for you? So um, it, it it definitely relaxed my body. Um, I was definitely um, kind of tensed up from today with just working. And it just really relaxed my shoulders. My whole body, I felt much more relaxed than I was when I first started the podcast. So um, it, it definitely helped in that regard. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, um, what I do when I do my deep breathing is I go to this place of mindfulness. So I try to be fully present in that moment. And I had the same type of situation that uh, you talked about. I kind of did a body scan. So then I was like, oh, let me <laughs> let me adjust my posture. And let me, you know, <laughs> crack my neck a little bit. And, oh, roll these shoulders back. Roll right? these shoulders back. Nah. Yeah, <laughs> because um, not realizing, you know, getting in the zone and working, working, working not realizing how much tension that we're holding. So when we're thinking about our kids and we're teaching them to manage these emotions that they're having, teaching them how to be able to truly still themselves so that they have a moment to assess what's happening, right? Lawanda said, it made me focus on my breathing and not my surroundings. Exactly, right? And that's the point. So if you think about a child who um, is, you know, kind of all over the place, and this this is a, um, a tip that we always want to remember with our kids and just with people in general. When a child is panicked or or someone is panicked and all over the place, anxious, not really sure what to do, you have to get to a place of relaxing prior to having conversation about how to move forward. So I want you to think about the last time that you had a whole bunch of stuff going on and somebody's like, you know, you need to chill out, blah, 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 blah. You're like, don't tell me to chill no. out on it, right? So you're like, yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> yep. <laughs> don't tell me to calm down, you know, um, <laughs> even though that is the one thing that you need to do. So what there are a few things that you can do in order to help your kids to calm down if you notice that they are anxious or that they are outside side of themselves. So one of the first things is the deep breathing, right? And there are different ways to do this. So you can do triangular breathing. So triangular breathing is breathe in, hold. Oh, wait, let me do it in the screen. Breathe in, hold, and out. Breathe in, hold, out, right? So that's triangular breathing. Then you also have box breathing. So box breathing is breathe in, hold, breathe out, hold, breathe in, hold, breathe out, hold. And you can do this for four beats. Um, you can do this for eight beats. You know, it's really, you kind of work your way up as you increase the stamina. And as you calm down, your capacity to breathe in and breathe out for a longer time period happens, right? So the first thing that you want to get them to is breathing. Now, if you have littles like, you know, three, four, five, six years old, a way to help them to conceptualize this is ask them to fog up a mirror. So if you hold a mirror, and I'm going to use my phone just because I don't have a mirror in front of me, but if you hold a mirror like this, you're going to ask them to breathe in, breathe out. And what you want is to see the fog come on the mirror. So that's very different than, right? The very shallow breathing that sustains life. So their goal is to create that fog on that mirror. And that really helps them to get a visual of what it looks like to do this breathing exercise. So the first thing you always want to say is, okay, we need to breathe. But then you also want to get some water. Water, not juice, not Gatorade, not soda water. So we know that our bodies are 70% water. And um, what we do is we replenish um, 
we replenish our our uh, water within our body so that our cells are able to function the way that it needs to function, right? So that our hormones are able to be um, diluted because cortisol is cortisol is the stress hormone cortisol is that hormone that makes us gain weight when we're stressed and retain weight in our midsections and all of that so the cortisol is being increased when we're stressed out so we need to dilute that so drinking water is a great way to be able to help with that or taking a walk now um we had a show before where we talked about gender differences and the way that boys and girls are different so with our boys we want to take a walk and have them talk side by side with them they relate better that way whereas with girls yes they need to take a walk but that relation needs to be face to face because they need to feel that connection Right. So implementing some of these things the same way that Cookie Monster was like, yes, yes, yes. I did the deep breathing. Yes. I sang a song. Yes. I talked about my book. Right. So the, the point is to be able to give our kids a, a plethora of strategies that they're able to use so that they can pull one of those strategies out of their toolbox when it is time to use it. So again, self-awareness, I know how I'm feeling. I recognize that I'm feeling some particular way. Then now, because I know that, let me um, use my self-management strategies so that I can accomplish my goal of being able to calm down. Make sense? It does. And that just goes back to um, when we keep talking about it, these are skills and these are mm -hmm. things that I think there's a misconception that when you're born, you automatically know how to do these things. Right. And I think that's why there's a disconnect with problem solving. That's a skill when it's, you know, managing your emotions. That's a skill. Social emotional learning, that is a skill. So it's something that we have to be intentional at home to have these conversations so that way we're able to resolve conflict and problem solve. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'm glad you brought that up. Um, you know, in the educational arena, even though, you know, as educators, we still need to be reminded about this, but we are used to the teaching of it, right? But we make so many assumptions like you should know or just calm down or just do whatever, but that's not, that's not hardwired within us to know how to do that. So this is a skill and it takes practice. And you may think that, um, just I'll speak for myself personally. So I do this, right? This is what I do. This is what I live. This is, you know, as a life coach, I talk to my clients about it. Like this is a way of life for me. But when this pandemic started, I wasn't remembering none of that stuff. <laughs> like I had to go back to base level one. Like, girl, what is going on with you? Why are you all over the place? Right. So there may be events that trigger situations um, where you wind up going right back to that that first things first of identifying the emotion and what it is that I'm feeling. And that is A-OK. -okay. So it's not something that you just master and you check off and you're like, yep, I'm out here killing it in this social emotional world. I'm out here killing it. Like, no, you may be killing it for the moment, but we are all one life situation away from needing to be reminded that we have to implement these strategies and these coping mechanisms on a consistent basis. So with our kids, we really need to make this second nature for them. It's almost, I always think about it like, uh, for instance, with a fire. Um, so if you catch on fire, you're supposed to do what? Extinguish it. No, if you catch on fire, what are the three things you're supposed to do? Hold on. My Siri was talking. What'd you say? When you catch on fire, instead of running, what are you supposed to do? Oh, stop, drop, and roll. Stop, drop, and roll. Right? So everybody's learned that since they were in kindergarten. You're supposed to stop, drop, and roll if you catch on fire. Right? But... The reason why that's been programmed in your mind is because what you want to do is run to extinguish it, right? Mm -hmm. But what you're supposed to do is to stop, drop, and roll. So it is... Um, 
it's that thing that you want to have is so ingrained in you that the likelihood of being able to pull it out is going to be more because it's been so ingrained in you. So we want these uh, coping strategies to be so ingrained within our kids that they're able to pull them out when they need them. So when they go to that self-awareness, they're like, okay, I noticed that, you know, I'm, I'm antsy. I noticed that, um, you know, I'm, I'm shaking my leg. I noticed that my palms are sweating. I noticed that, you know, I can't keep still and I'm all over the place. Oh, what coping strategies do I have? Let me take a moment to breathe. Let me take a moment to um, sing a song. Let me take a moment to drink some water. Let me take a moment to do some type of physical exercise or walking, right? That's the goal. Now, this is a very lofty goal, okay? This mm -hmm. is lofty, but it is something that we uh, can accomplish if we continue to do it. So Lawanda says, sometimes being anxious is the norm. As a teacher, I have to remember not to assume anything. Yes. So many of us, this is why I hate using the word normal, right? Because everybody's normal is very different. So your normal and my normal, it is so subjective of what normal looks like. So what I like to use is healthy. Um, I like to say that this is a healthy behavior. This is an unhealthy behavior. So to Lawanda's point, many of our kids have been living in anxious uh, situations the whole time. Their whole life stressful. They anxious all the time. So they may not necessarily even notice that there is a difference or your kid may have been depressed prior to this. And now they're still depressed. So you're thinking this is normal. It's normal that my child is withdrawn. It's normal mm -hmm. that my child has negative self-talk. It's normal that my child doesn't want to go out with the family. Like all of this is normal. It's normal that they tell me that their stomach hurt. Well, it's normal in the context of this is what has been happening the whole time. But is it healthy? It's not healthy, right? So we can't afford to overlook it and write it off as normal. We really have to unpack that and say, uh, these are healthy behaviors. So a healthy person has coping mechanisms. A healthy person is able to communicate what is going on with them physically, what's going on with them emotionally. That's healthy, right? And if we're not healthy, then we need to do what we need to do to get healthy, as opposed to just being like, well, I ain't healthy. So it is what it is. That's like us going to the doctor and them telling you that you got the sugar diabetes and you like, cool. So I'm going to go home and eat a cake. Because that's what I do. <laughs> right. So, right. no, you're going to try to make some type of life change to to deal with um, the unhealthy situation that's happening. So it's that same type of thing when we talk about mental health issues. Um, it's that same type of thing. What you thinking over there? I'm just thinking about the kids right now and thinking about how, you know, this time during COVID, They've been in broken communities and they've been, you know, broken children. We haven't gotten to the root and haven't given them a safe space. And then they've been in broken school environments. And mm -hmm. then all of that compounded together is like our children need an outlet. Our children mm -hmm. need a voice. And parents have to be more equipped than ever to be intentional with their children. Because like I said, Day by day, I witness the stuff that's taking place on social media. And I, I my heart just hurts because I, there was kids doing the foreigner challenge. The foreigner What's challenge that? is where they were out there. There's a song by Pop Smoke. And it's a song where they literally are showing their bodies. They are naked. And that's child pornography mm. on TikTok. Mm. And, and it was going viral. And it's like, y'all... Your children are participating in these apps. You guys are not intentional. You have your children all in one room and they on their cell phones in their own little world. And no one has came to bring it together and say, look, this is we need to have some intentional conversations. It, it's mm -hmm. sad. Mm -hmm. So that's just where my heart just keeps going. Like 
I, parents, you have to be intentional with your children because I'm telling you that if you're not being intentional and in having these conversations that we're talking about, I promise you that they're having these conversations with someone else. And some of the people that they're having these conversations with do not have the best interest in your child. They are predators and right. they're grooming your children and looking at the stats with human trafficking and sex trafficking and what's taking place and all of our children going missing. Just be intentional, and we could save so many children's lives. Really, yeah. truly, it's sad. It's it's really serious. Um, it's not a game, and I think some of us, because maybe it hasn't come to our doorstep, that we don't realize how close you know we are to it. Um, but the root of all of that is seeking acceptance. And that our kids are operating in a state of fear because they don't have relationships with the adults that are in their lives. Right. And when you ask, that's why we said when you ask these questions of how they're feeling about stuff or what are their thoughts on these things, that is so important for you to create the platform where they are able to say what they're really feeling. And then when they say what they're feeling, then you have to validate that. It is okay for them to be afraid. It's okay for them to be sad. Um, Lawanda said isolation from their friends. It's okay for them to feel lonely and to feel like they miss their friends. Like that is okay. School was a safe place for the safest place for many of our kids. They look forward to it because it was consistent. They knew what to expect. They had a schedule. They had structure. They had routine. Like they all, they, they knew when I go to school, this is what I know I'm going to eat. I know that there is at least one person on this campus that if something pops off, I can go to that person and I can talk to them. Right. And that may not necessarily be the case in the home environment. So our challenge to you is to help it to be more of that. Help it to be more of that case. And that means that there has to be the willingness to truly have these conversations and practice these things together. You might be listening and saying to yourself, shoot, I don't even know how to manage my own anxiety. Cool. Use these strategies. This is a place to start and you all practice together. So think about the power that it would be for you to tell your kids, you know, I'm feeling really anxious because, you know, mommy hasn't worked in however long. And, you know, daddy is is out here trying to figure out a way to make sure the lights stay on. And that makes me nervous. You know, that makes me nervous. So what I decided to do is to make sure that I breathe every day. What I decided to do is make sure that I take time to journal. What I decided to do is make sure that, you know, I'm eating healthy and that I'm exercising. Right. So think about the power in that, because what I'll say is the kids know they know that you're not at peace. They know they notice it that no matter how much you're trying to hide it. And by no means am I saying to bring kids into adult problems like I don't believe in that. Right. So I'm not saying sit down with them and be like the lights getting cut off tomorrow because whatever. Like I'm not saying that. But the realities of what the situation are or the 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 angst that you may have around a particular situation. That's real. You know, they know you ain't been at work. We all been sitting here in the house looking at each other, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, there is some type of anxiety that that goes with that. So being able to really have that conversation is super powerful. Um, but then validating what they are saying and then helping them to face those fears coming up with a baby step plan. Everything is not going to get better at a finger snap. Mm -hmm. So coming up with a plan to really help them to be able to put these things um, into consistent practice is a way that we can help our kids and really help to take them off of the edge um, that they might be feeling. And then if all of that, let's say none of that is working for you and you just don't know what to do um, from there, don't be afraid to seek professional help. There is nothing wrong with going to a, a therapist or a counselor, um, tapping, you know, somebody else in to say, hey, this is what's going on with with me or this is what's going on with my child. So I do want to share for those of you who are in Tampa. 
I want to share the um, the the uh, hotline that was set up for mental health support so that you are able to tap into that. So the mental health support number is 813-272-4787. Again, 813-272-4787. Eight, seven. And that's for you to get mental health support from um, those of you who are here in Tampa. Now, let's say you're outside of Tampa. There have been um, lots of telehealth um, resources that have come about where you are able to get support or contacting your local crisis center here in Tampa. The number is 211. Um, I'm not sure if that works in other places, but if you Google crisis center for your area, then you'll be able to get that support. If you feel that you don't necessarily have the skills to, to be able to help and you need to tap in a professional, do that. Do that so that we can come out on the other side of this better, as opposed to just allowing ourselves to be victim to circumstance and allowing our children to become more of a victim to circumstance. Let's do what we can to truly advocate for them and, and do what's best. Yeah. Because ignoring, ignoring the trauma is not going to make it go away. That part that part. It only gets worse. And what we don't want to do is have to repair broken adults. Frederick Douglass has a quote and he says, it's better to raise strong men than repair broken adults. So we want to do what we can now while they're young to help them to deal with the issues that are coming up now, as opposed to waiting until they're adults and now they have their own families and now they are trying to figure out how to fix what happened with them while they help their kids. Let's give them the tools and strategies now. And it's, again, it's simple things that, um, that we can do in order to start developing these strategies and these competencies with our, with our kids. Even if it's just as simple as we're going to take five minutes a day to sit here and breathe. Yeah. That is progress because it's not something that we do normally, but it is something that is healthy for us to do. So um, that is our challenge to all of you. Um, for those of you who are watching this on the replay or those of you who might be watching on YouTube, um, we want to challenge you to do the same, um, to really, and then tell us what happened, right? So if you decide to have these conversations um, with your kids or you, you do this breathing challenge, talk to us about what happens and what type of conversation that sparked or what's something new that you learned after having that conversation with your kid about how they are feeling. Um, so we'd love to engage with you in that way to really be able to continue this conversation. Yeah. And like one of the previous episodes, we were talking about how some of the children feel as though that, you know, their parents don't get them or understand right. them. And right now when we're in quarantine, I, you know, with this challenge, I really hope that everyone is intentional and in having these intentional conversations moving forward. Because um, as I said again, and I'll say it again and again and again, if you're not having these conversations with your children at home, they desire to have those conversations and let's pray and hope that is not with the wrong person that does not have good intentions for them. Right. right. Yeah, for sure. So um, we are here as resources for you all. We both have our Instagram um, handles down there. You can find me at Kimberlyn J on Instagram. You can find me on Facebook at Kimberlyn Jackson. Um, I, I, I do this, right? So I am a life coach. So if any of you as adults are thinking to yourself that uh, you want some of this type of support, feel free to reach out to me. You can preview the curriculum by going to my website, KimberlynJackson.com. And there's a banner at the top that talks, to, it says, discover your destiny. So you're able to click there and to see what the curriculum looks like. Um, but I'm also an educator and the kids are my heart. So uh, I, I am here at your disposal. If you have questions, you want to connect, you have ideas, you're just wondering what this can look like, definitely reach out because that's what we're here for. And that's why we're doing this. 
And I'm so glad that you're here. So just thank you again, Kimberlyn, for your experience, your expertise, and you being willing to come on um, and having these conversations. I think it's very helpful for the community. And for those of you that are watching or catch the replay, I really hope that you guys share this information because Facebook is not going to share it on its own. So for those of you that's watching, just hit the share button. It doesn't hurt. <laughs> It's only going to help make sure that we break these cycles, because if we want our communities to get to the next level, then we have to do our part to really empower each other with the information. So this is free uh, information that we are sharing here. So let's take advantage of it so that we can make a difference. That's it. Well, thank you again for this wonderful episode. Thank you, Kimberlyn Jackson. Um, you are phenomenal. And for those of you that will catch this later, thank you guys for supporting Teaching for the Culture. Um, this has been a very interesting journey. I'm very humbled and I'm very excited for the progress and um, these this platform and what it's going to become. So thank you guys again. Uh, thank you, Kimberlyn. Um, no and until next time, we'll, we'll see you soon, guys. We'll see you soon. Bye, y'all. Bye, y'all.